Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben Rhodes, all the way live from his childhood bedroom. Uh, but this time, uh, as a New York Times bestseller, again. I got to thank all the worldos out there. Thanks so much. Uh, it's been, I mean, it feels like this book came out about a year ago, but it's only been a couple weeks. Um, we clocked in at number three on the, the combined New York Times bestseller list, which yeah. is great. I'm a little pissed that O'Reilly was a spot ahead of you. I think there's still I time mean, for the world those to remedy that. I was going to say, uh, look, to, if people thought we were harping too much on Bill O'Reilly, like came in right after him. He was number two, killing the mob. Congrats to, to Clint Smith for, for you yes. know, taking out the king there, um, taking the first <laughs> yes. slot. Um, but yeah, we were just, just behind Bill O'Reilly. We got time. We got, I mean, time. we got time. Uh, we have an amazing show today, Ben. We have Joe Biden's first foreign trip and what the media wants us to believe is a huge showdown with Vladimir Putin. So we'll we'll learn about that. We get to say bye bye, BB Netanyahu. That makes my heart grow two sizes. Uh, there's already a new prime minister uh, in government in Israel. We have threats against K-pop. Some great news about efforts to eradicate a horrible disease. And then we'll end by having some fun by making fun of two of the biggest assholes on the international stage. We'll make the world does here wait to see who it is. Ben, Joe Biden is abroad as we speak on his first foreign trip. That is, it's been exciting to watch, bringing back some fun memories of how brutal those things are. I, the, the, I mean, they were my favorite part of the job as hard as they were. I haven't felt much FOMO this entire time, but uh, it's great to see like America with a bunch of decent people <laughs> who are trying to do the right thing, uh, representing them uh, on the world stage. So it's been good. To, it's been good to watch and it's brought back all kinds of memories, too. So Biden had meetings with the G7 leaders in the UK. He hung out with Queen Elizabeth at Windsor Castle. He went to Brussels to meet with the NATO alliance uh, and European Union leadership. And he had a one on one with President Erdogan of Turkey. Uh, we record this on Tuesday afternoon. On Wednesday, Biden is going to meet with Vladimir Putin. So, Ben, I think we maybe just take this in, in reverse chronological order and start with this Putin meeting in Geneva. Um, it was interesting to me at, at Biden's press conference yesterday where he said that all these NATO leaders he talked to were actually happy that he's meeting with Putin. I think the conventional wisdom going in was maybe they'd be upset. Um, the last time a U.S. president met with Putin was in 2018, which was the disaster in Helsinki that we all remember with Donald Trump. So the U.S. media is just completely obsessed with this meeting. The first three questions at Biden's uh, post-NATO press conference were about the Putin meeting. All of them were multiple parts, so I guess you could call it six questions. Time magazine uh, put Biden and Putin on the cover, which would have been a huge deal in 1998. Um, the, issues, <laughs> <laughs> the issues they'll talk about are obviously important, right? Like hacking, Ukraine, arms control. The question, I guess, is like what can you reasonably expect him to accomplish in a meeting? The Biden team is lowering expectations, including in your very excellent interview with John Finer last week. Like, what do you think is the best case outcome for the meeting? And then, like, I don't know, how do you build on it afterwards? I mean, we talked to, to Finer last week about just, first of all, why are they having a meeting? Um, and I think their judgment coming in was probably that. You know, Russia had done a whole bunch of shit to us, the solar winds attack, the interference in our election. They detained Navalny. That's not to us, but that's something we don't like. Um, and then Biden had done a whole bunch of sanctions in response. And I think they wanted the meeting to kind of test whether they could just stop this spiral where it felt like we were on the precipice of like ever escalating cyber wars and trading sanctions and the rest of it. I think, unfortunately, like even since they announced the meeting, Putin's pretty much indicated that he's not going to change. You had the Belarus airliner <laughs> diverted, uh, which the Russians were clearly involved in. You've had more ransomware attacks, you know, reportedly from within Russia. You've had Putin doing media tours where he like, you know, echoes right wing talking points about Joe Biden being old and January 6th being like a like a hang at the Capitol. Um so I, I think like, look, the, the best case scenario is that there's a symbolic value in the American president being seen to kind of stand up to Vladimir Putin and deliver a bunch of tough messages on a bunch of stuff. It kind of puts the final period on the America's backstage of the Biden foreign policy. Um, I think there's some areas where they might you know, want to at least explore, can we make some progress? They want to keep a border open into Syria to provide humanitarian aid to refugees and displaced people there. And the Russians can block that. They want to start some kind of discussion around arms control and nuclear weapons that kind of fell by the wayside um, under Trump. They very much want to 
enlist the Russians into some discussion about nations being responsible for stopping ransomware and cyber attacks from within their borders. Putin is obviously going to resist that, but they want to at least get a dialogue going. They want the Russians to be constructive in, in trying to get back into the Iran nuclear deal. So there's stuff where like they could come out of this with some cooperation, but like it's not I mean, it's not going to change the fundamental negative orientation of U.S. Russian relations. It's not going to change Vladimir Putin's behavior after 20 years. I mean, part of what's difficult about all this media hype is that, you know, it like it it sets up that this is going to be some sea change when it's not. It's going to be you know, a chance for the, these two guys to sit face to face and tell each other what they think and hopefully, you know, prevent worse outcomes. <laughs> but I, I don't think you're going to see some dramatic breakthrough or or some dramatic, you know, fight is not going to be like a punch up at the summit, you know. So uh, I think even though we're taping this before, I think we have a pretty good idea where it's headed. Yeah, I think you're right. And also like reinvigorating the NATO alliance is, is going to be, you know, maybe the most important part of Biden's approach to Russia. Uh, I saw, you know, the narrative going into some of these NATO meetings was that maybe a bunch of countries were pissed off about Biden's decision to pull all U.S. troops uh, out of Afghanistan in September. I didn't see a ton of that in the, the post-summit cover, to be honest. Um, like you said earlier, like Biden clearly benefited from the contrast with Trump, who went into this the last summit calling NATO obsolete. He refused to mention Article 5 in his <laughs> yeah. first NATO speech, which is like yeah. either the crux of the entire thing. The two major storylines I saw coming out of NATO were one, NATO's first real recognition that China's military and cyber capabilities now pose a threat. And two, there was briefly some confusion about whether Ukraine had been formally admitted into NATO. That was wrong. Biden made clear in his press conference that no, nothing had changed. Ukraine still needs to meet a bunch of criteria around the corruption and rule of law and professionalizing its military before they can be admitted. Um, Ukrainian President, uh, President Zelensky express some, I think, uh, fair frustration at that process and said he just like wants a yes or a no. So Ben, two questions. One, how significant do you think this China piece is, like China being mentioned in this NATO communique? And then two, given the fact that Russia and Ukraine are like literally in a low grade war as we speak and have been for years, does the international community really think it's a good idea to admit Ukraine into NATO right now if we are going to affirm Article 5 of the the NATO charter, which says an attack on one is an attack on all? First of all, like the sequencing of this is very intentional, right? Like go to the UK, you're meeting with yep. like the core beating heart of the democratic world. And then you're going to NATO and meeting with like the bigger security alliance of the democratic world. And then with all this backup, you're going to go in and deliver these messages to Putin. On the Ukraine thing, so people know the background, Ukraine and Georgia were offered what's called membership action plans during the Bush administration. Um, and this was even then seen as quite provocative. You know, three Baltic republics, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, that had been a part of the former Soviet Union had already come into NATO. And, and these were two countries that, you know, were clearly going to be provocative in terms of extending this invite vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I don't need to tell you that because since membership action plans were offered, Russia has invaded and occupied parts of both of those countries. Yeah. Clearly, like a, an animating it. force of everything about Vladimir Putin has basically been these two countries are not going to go into NATO. And I think that the awkward truth here, no matter how much you care about Ukrainian sovereignty, and we should, and Ukraine's ability to choose its own relationships, is it's Article 5 says an attack on one is an attack on all, and you have to mean it. You, you know, if, if suddenly you're taking in countries where, you know, you're not sure if you'd go to war to defend them, the whole purpose of the alliance collapses. And let's face it, do Americans want to go into World War Three? I mean, Russia's in Ukraine right now. The logic of right. them being in NATO is that we would go to war with Russia right. because they're there. And this is the awkward dance that Biden has to act like we're still open to this. But I think commonsensically people know, like, this is not happening anytime soon, you know. Um, but you don't want to kind of totally w withdraw it because you don't want to look like you're caving to the Russians. Um, but you also don't want Zelensky to be out there saying, oh, yeah, it's all done. We're coming into NATO. So we've got to be careful about this. The China thing, look, I think it was important that at the G7, China was on, on, on the agenda. I think at NATO, it's important for them to kind of be noting it as they kind of did in the, the communique as something that the alliance is going to have to think about. But like, I'm a little wary of like saying to NATO, OK, now like we're out of Afghanistan. We're dealing with the Russians over here, but but now we're going to like, 
get ready for the next conflict with China. Um, let's take one step at a time here. <laughs> like we got to get out of Afghanistan. We got to fortify Europe and, and Eastern European security in the face of Russia. We got to think about cyber challenges. Got to think about yeah. the Mediterranean and the Aegean, where there's a lot of uh, activity related to counterterrorism and introducing China is something that is discussed at NATO summits. I think it makes sense, but but the idea that like NATO is going to be patrolling the South China Sea here, like that's let's let's calm down there too, you know. So, yeah. like I think that what the Biden team is trying to do is shape the agenda for all these institutions going forward. Like these are going to be things that we need to talk about, and I think that's right. I wouldn't over crank the China piece. On Monday's Pod Save America, we talked a bit about the frustration from activists that G7 countries didn't do more to commit to helping uh, developing countries get COVID vaccines and, uh, you know, do more on climate change, specifically hastening the transition away from coal-fired power plants. So, you know, given the urgency of of both those problems, I think it's obviously fair to want more. I bet Biden's team agrees, and they're really focused, you know, when it comes to climate on that big uh, next climate change summit in November. Uh, Ben, like, I think Brexit was hanging over the entire summit. Uh, Biden and apparently President Macron of France pushed Boris Johnson really hard on issues around Brexit in Northern Ireland. The UK itself is struggling to reopen because of an uptick in COVID cases. Again, like the change in tone really did help gloss over, I think, a lot of the substantive challenges. But what did you make of the G7? Like success, failure, TBD? So I thought the most interesting thing uh, is I mentioned this when Biden gave a speech to Congress uh, when he shifted to foreign policy, like he didn't mention terrorism for a while. I was struck by just the agenda of the G7 was a totally different agenda than anyone we've seen before. The agenda was COVID. It was climate change. It was China. It was democracy. It was anti-corruption. All these things that, you know, we've been talking about on this podcast for a few years, like that is now what the agenda is for the world's democracies. And that is important and new to have the U.S. kind of emphasizing that set of issues. Um, I mean, we obviously did some of this in the Obama years, but I mean, you really didn't see the Middle East and terrorism front and center in the ways that that has been the case in the past. I think that's good. And that's a space to watch. That means the U.S. and all these multilateral institutions is kind of going to be focused on a post post 9-11 foreign policy for really the first time. I think on the scale, the ambition, like people are right to, to push. I think on each one, Part of this is its early days. I think on climate, the Europeans are like, well, what are you guys really going to do, you Americans? Yeah. Like, we're back, you know, as, as we keep saying and hearing. But like, what is our bill going to be that passes through Congress? Like the biggest thing America can do to reduce our emissions in the near term is pass the most ambitious climate bill possible. And, you know, it's not clear whether that stuff is going to get sacrificed on the altar of bipartisanship. Um, you know, so I, I think it's just going to take until that summit uh, in Glasgow later in the year before we know kind of how ambitious the U.S. can be with our target, which is part of how we get other nations to be more ambitious. I do think the Biden team is going to have to deliver. They've raised a lot of expectations that we're going to lead the fight against uh, vaccine inequity, against climate change and kind of promoting a global foreign policy for the middle class, like like minimum taxation. A lot of these things are commitments without, you know, the substance behind them yet. That's to be expected when it's June of your first year in office. But I mean, they've, they've kind of set the report card for themselves. Like, are they going to be able to, to elevate the ambition on climate? Are they going to be able to elevate the ambition in getting rid of coal? Are they going to be able to elevate the, the global minimum tax? And, and we'll see. And, and I mean, we should be rooting for that. It was good to see that, you know, I think Pew Research did a poll uh, of 12 foreign countries. And in some of them, you know, America's favorability was up by as much as 30 points but the flip side of that was majorities, and I think all of the countries surveyed, or at least most of them, expressed concern about the state of America's democracy itself. So no surprise there yeah, as to yeah. why. Ben, this is old news now, but did you see the story about the cicadas swarming the engine of the press charter and delaying their departure time? I did. I did. I did. Uh, <laughs> it, it was, <laughs> that press charter is like the subject of more drama. Um, I, it's so than, cursed. Uh, it's it's it, yeah it's yeah it was cursed on our first foreign trip uh, wasn't it grounded oh, yeah. for days for by a, a malfunction yes. or something yes so like just so everyone knows like a lot of the foreign trips right you have reporters on Air Force One that's the pool it's a smaller group then the White House charters a separate plane to take the rest of the press corps like ahead I was often manifested on that plane um, and it means you get up at god awful times you land hours and hours early and just like sit there and wait and you know sometimes 
it can work out in your favor. Like that time you just mentioned, Ben, the plane broke down and we got stuck in Istanbul for like an extra day. So I got to do Hagia Sophia, the Blue Mosque, like all the cool things. Another time we had to kill, I think, 10 hours at the W Hotel in Bali while you guys were all still uh, at the summit at the end yeah, of the yeah, long yeah, swing. Yeah. So that was a know, better, it cuts both yeah, ways. Yeah, I, I'm going to do a very quick explainer, Tommy, on something in your wheelhouse, which is why all these questions at the press conferences are so annoyingly the same, right? Because mm-hmm. you, like you said, it's like three or four questions in a row that's the same question about Putin. And it's because they often call on the TV reporters all of whom want to be seen on television asking, like, do you think he's a killer? You know, and so they're yep. repeating these questions in ways that is super annoying, given how much other stuff there's to talk about. That said, um, as, as frustrated as I would be by the dominance of the Putin coverage, if I was in the White House, if you put a big old Putin summit at the end of your trip, <laughs> like you're going to get a lot of people asking those questions, you know. Yeah, that that's uh, exactly right. Um, all right. We are going to shift gears to uh, our friend Bibi Netanyahu. I'm a little uh, upset to see, Ben, that there is just a breaking news alert that Israel is launching airstrikes into Gaza, according to Palestinian security sources. So maybe we'll be able to track that as we go here. But that's very bad news. But let's stick to the good news. So at long last, Bibi Netanyahu is no longer the prime minister of Israel. He was prime minister for 15 years, including the last 12 in a row. Now he's just another racist, corrupt, authoritarian member of parliament. And that's a good thing. Um, On Sunday night, the Knesset voted in the new government by a single vote, 60 to 59. It was so close that one lawmaker had to leave her hospital bed, vote, and then go back to the hospital. Uh, Netanyahu supporters decided to go out in the most obnoxious, childish way possible. They heckled the new prime minister, Naftali Bennett, during his speech. Uh, Netanyahu himself delivered a speech where he pledged to, quote, lead you in a daily battle against this bad and dangerous left-wing government and bring it down, end quote. He also bragged about giving the finger to the United States, saying, the Biden administration asked me not to make our disagreements on the Iran nuclear deal public. With all due respect to President Biden, I refused. He then compared returning to the Iran nuclear deal to the decision by FDR not to bomb the train tracks that led to Auschwitz in 1944. Just a truly disgusting and offensive comparison and one that makes me just pissed off all over again at the big brains in Washington who say the United States can't ever criticize Bibi Netanyahu publicly when he's like comparing the JCPOA to the the Holocaust. Uh, anyway, Ben, I know I shouldn't gloat. That's some loud, coalition... intense diplomacy there from Netanyahu. <laughs> That's some yeah. loud, intense <laughs> I, I, I will try not to gloat. I'm already gloating. This thing's fragile. BB is like the monster at the end of a horror movie. He comes back. But like yeah. any parting thoughts, any parting words for Mr. Netanyahu? The takeaways that offer that I think are slightly different than what I've said before about this creep um you know one vigilance is required like he's still there in the same way that trump is still there like in the same way that he's become even more radicalized on the way out just like trump did with all of his batshit crazy allegations and offensive remarks Um, number two like i i think it's interesting how you know looking at the full scale and breadth of this opposition it made me realize like this is a tactic we're seeing in more and more countries like in hungary you know, which I obviously write about in my book, like the entire opposition put this big umbrella over them, you know, from Mm -hmm. a former far right party to the socialist party to some kind of centrist uh, uh, parties. Yeah. Because they're like, you know what? We all agree we have to get rid of this guy and then we can fight it out amongst ourselves. And I think that's a very healthy tactic and it's necessary. It's, by the way, the same thing kind of the Democratic Party did here. It's not like AOC endorsing Joe Biden. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Right. So I think lesson to be learned. Right. Remain vigilant. But, you know, unifies an opposition to get rid of the corrupt autocrat. I'll be watching like whether he's convicted. I mean, I think that like part of the hope of this new government is that like Bibi can actually be convicted of the, all the crimes yeah. he's been indicted for. And then that might more permanently settle things in terms of his role uh, in Israeli politics. I think the Republican Party's kind of full blending together with Bibiism and the Likud party in, in Israel was like fully completed for me when I saw like Nikki Haley like tweeting out photos with like that, that nut job evangelical preacher guy, John Hagee and, and oh, BB calling him Prime Minister Netanyahu, even though he's no longer Prime Minister, in his residence, which he, I don't know how he's still like hanging out in the Prime Minister residence. Yeah. So like the Republican Party's embrace of this, again, this is garbage. The, the, the guy on the way at the door pra- bragged about bashing the Democratic president, who was very careful to say he would never criticize BB publicly. Like, we do, like let's just 
let's be able to criticize a government that, that does things that we disagree with at times. And if these reports about Gaza are true, I mean, it's a sign that nothing really changed for the Palestinians. And you even saw this new government approve a, a, a far right like protest march through Jerusalem, not really protest, uh, incitement, like a provi- yeah. incitement march, basically. The Hamas had said that they would respond to that. Hopefully, cooler heads prevail, and hopefully the need to have consensus in this government uh, whole- moderates it to some extent. But um, but yes, let's enjoy Bibi Nenya being gone, recognize that a lot of people worked very hard against long odds to, to accomplish at least that. And, and then we can enjoy that and then hope Israelis take the next step. Yeah, agreed. And, and Yair had... Um you know, like a, a not at all naive, but like hopeful take on on how things could get better, how you could see more air participation in politics, a more moderate coalition than what anything you'd see under Netanyahu. So uh, we'll see. And obviously, we'll be tracking this news. Um, but let's turn to Nigeria, uh, because on June 4th, the Nigerian Ministry of Information announced that they the government had suspended Twitter operations in the country after Twitter froze Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari's account and deleted one of his tweets that was interpreted by many as a threat of genocide against an ethnic group. That seems like a very good reason uh, to delete a tweet. Twitter has been an important tool for activists in Nigeria who want to raise awareness about issues like police brutality. They want to organize protests. They want to connect with each other. Uh, so this suspension is really a big deal for them, who could, and they could now be prosecuted if they you know, use a VPN and find some way to tweet, which many of them are doing. Um, because our former president is a selfish arsonist, he decided to weigh in on this matter on his sad little website, and he congratulated Nigeria for banning Twitter. He also encouraged other countries to ban Twitter and Facebook for, quote, not allowing free and open speech. All voices should be heard. Then, if irony wasn't dead, I would point out the irony of a ban on social media for not allowing free speech. But alas, irony has been dead since 2016, so I will not. Yeah. So. Trump also called these two American companies, uh, Facebook and Twitter, evil. He said he might have banned them, too, except, quote, Zuckerberg kept calling me and coming to the White House for dinner, telling me how great I was. 2024, question mark? Anyway, then. That I believe. This, that I believe. That, yeah. that I do believe, yeah. too. That I totally uh, believe. <laughs> so two questions for you. Do you think this kind of ban is tenable uh, in Nigeria? I, in, in like, what's the impact, do you think, of a former president of the United States cheerleading a crackdown uh, on free speech uh, and activists like this? Well, I think what what's most dangerous to take the second one, Trump and these guys like who rail against Twitter, and we saw Modi um, kind of harassing yep. Twitter and, and Facebook as well. Um, they, they, they don't do it because they think they're getting a raw deal. They, they, they do it because they know they're getting the best deal possible, which is guys like Trump and Modi you know, can flood Twitter with their trolls and disinformation and then charge that you're stifling free speech if you like remove something that is promoting an insurrection in this country or, (laughs) you know, a genocide in Nigeria. Um, Whine about cancel culture. They're not doing that because they actually believe free speech is being constrained. They're doing that to intimidate these platforms from taking any stand against the kind of authoritarian garbage and disinformation flood that like runs across these platforms. Uh, and so I think it, Trump contributing to that kind of global normalization of the idea that the authoritarians get to choose what free speech is and the platforms have to accept that reality and the rest of us just have to live in a world in which, you know, a whole swath of society is being like, you know, spoon fed mainlined garbage. Like that's bad. <laughs> that, um, I, I think in Nigeria taking this step too, it's not, you know, Nigeria is the biggest country in Africa. It's kind of a bellwether. So part of what you worry about is both discourse in Nigeria, but also other countries kind of following suit. At the end of the day, though, and this is something we'll have to pull the thread on, you know, over the course of the, the year, Tommy, on this podcast, like these platforms are going to have to make choices at a certain point. Like, are they actually going to police certain types of content on, on their platforms? In which case they probably will be kicked out of certain countries. Mm-hmm. Or are they going to kind of allow their platforms to be manipulated like this? And and I have to say, like, at the end of the day, at some point, they're going to have to get to a place where they lose some market access because they're actually trying to do the right thing. Uh, I would also hope that, you know, taking away Twitter in a massive country like Nigeria with a huge discourse creates some pressures from within Nigeria for them to restore Twitter because, like, that can't be a particularly popular thing either. So, like, some of these battles are going to be fought within countries. Some of these battles are going to be fought between the platforms and governments. But I think the basic principle has to be 
we are for free and open debate, but there's certain kinds of incitement and certain kinds of disinformation that has clearly been incredibly corrosive to democracy everywhere and to like a healthy functioning societies everywhere. And I'd rather see the platform start to take that on than just kind of fold whenever they get brushed back by an authoritarian or, or a kind of quasi authoritarian in this case leader. Yeah. I mean, especially something that was viewed as a threat of genocide against an ethnic group. I mean, we, we saw what happened when that kind of content was allowed to stay up in Myanmar. There were literally yeah. devastating consequences. Many people died, um, really horrible outcomes. Okay. Some, uh, exciting news for you, Ben. So some very rare, very good, uh, disease related news for you after a year of pandemic. So scientists in Indonesia, they figured out a way to drastically reduce the transmission of dengue fever by infecting mosquitoes with a bacteria that then prevents the mosquitoes from getting infected by the dengue virus. I will not pretend for one second to understand how this works, but the results of a trial uh, in a city in Indonesia reduced the incidence of dengue among humans by 77%, so just enormous success. Nice. The World Health Organization uh, describes dengue fever as one of the top 10 threats to global health, and it infects an estimated 390 million people every year. Uh, there's also evidence that this method could could work against the Zika virus. It could work against uh, yellow fever. So it truly could be game changer and turn the mosquito from like a lethal human killing machine to just like an annoying pain in the ass when there's one in your room. So just great, great news. Yeah. And, and look, dengue fever sucks. Uh, I've never had it, but I know a bunch of people who have, including people who got it on, on White House trips that we took to mm -hmm. places like Southeast Asia. It really messes you up. It can really slow you down. It can really sap your energy. And that leads to the point that like, not only is this great for health, but in some nations, it's like a productivity issue, right? Yeah, like people, it's like a really economic issue. Yeah. It's an economic issue because like there's such crippling dengue fever and that is such an impact on people's capacity. If you're talking about like an agricultural economy or, you know, uh, like people having to, to put in a hard day's work, like when they just, they can't with dengue fever. Um, and it also shows like, I hope that one of the things that, as we're, we're looking at the G7 and pumping money into pandemic preparedness, just investing globally in health security, which is something we began doing the Obama administration. But like we should be finding ways, even as we're arguing about like the origins of COVID, like to be working through the World Health Organization, working with groups of other countries, investing in ways to, to cure these diseases, because the positive impact, not just in lives saved, but economic productivity and quality of life, the upside is so high. And, and, and I think what we've seen, look at the, our own vaccine effort, like just surging some resources to get to that vaccine, like got it much faster than people thought. Like if we yep. if we put that kind of concerted effort and resourcing globally into fighting a whole range of these diseases, like a lot of good can come out of, of that effort. Yes. Yes. Imagine if we had another two, three, four years until we had a vaccine. It's it's I can't even imagine it. It's too, yeah. it's too awful. Um Super quick update. So last week, uh, Ben and I talked about the election that was happening in Peru. It was a socialist first time candidate against this corrupt right wing former like kind of first lady candidate. So with nearly all the results in uh, Pedro Castillo, the socialist candidate has won. So congrats to him. Congrats to the people of Peru. The very hard uh, governing choices come next, but just wanted to give everybody a quick update on that one. Fascinating to see like someone elected on a pretty far left platform. Um, with in basically a 50 50 country uh and and in his initial comments he's kind of tried to thread the needle like saying reassuring things like i'm not gonna upend the entire system while also saying he's gonna transform peru and so be interesting to watch how he does you know but it, it's yeah. again further sign of the thing things moving left down there okay this is a little worse news kim jong-un is coming for pop culture again this fucking uh, this pisses time, me off so much uh, yeah this time it's k-pop i know just man keep, so just, look yeah First of all, K-pop is powerful, so he better watch his ass. But yeah. uh, Kim Jong-un, he called it a vicious cancer. He said it's corrupting the entire hairstyles and speeches uh, and behavior of young North Koreans. The New York Times reported that in recent months, Kim has ranted about South Korean movies and music like almost every day. Last year, North Korea passed a law that could get you five to 15 years in a forced labor camp if you're caught with like South Korean media videos, you know, thumb drives with shows on it, whatever. Ben, here's my question for you. Uh, he sounds a little scared here. Do the Scorpions need to record a song in Korean? Are we like a K-pop wind of change away from reunifying the peninsula? I, 
I I mean, it, look, it, it shows goes to show, right? Like that, what he knows is that Koreans love K-pop. And I'm sure that includes North Koreans as well as South Koreans. I've always believed that in these circumstances of like just diametrically opposed political systems and, and foreign policy, like the, the biggest vulnerability is often cultural because people are like looking at K-pop and they're like, well, that looks like a pretty good deal over there. What's what is the society and political model that allowed them to create that? You know, um, and it's not about nuclear weapons. It's not about America. It's just about like, hey, these are other Koreans like doing this incredible thing that is totally changing global culture that I want to be a part of. Right. And and you would think that, yeah, that would make Kim Jong un a little nervous, because if you've seen the North Korean kind of film industry, you know, like, like <laughs> Kim Jong un on horseback, it, let's just say that's not going to hit it with the demo. As, as well no. as like BTS's, you know? <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, like jokes aside, I mean, the fact that people are willing to risk 15 years in a forced labor camp to watch a movie is a real indication of the power of art and culture. It's also an interesting story, I think, about the degree to which a totalitarian state can control what its public consumes in 2021, right? Like China is trying to do this through these incredibly high tech means. North Korea is going old school and they're just trying to ban stuff. But this New York Times piece, uh, it noted that a lot of North Korean propaganda describes South Korea as like a hellhole full of people begging on the streets, like searching for food. But if you watch these like South Korean, I guess soap opera type things. Yes. Like North Koreans were learning about how people yes. in South Korea were going on diets to get in shape at a time when there was a famine in the North. So it really does like puncture the whole system. Yeah, no, when I was in government, I heard like, I, like I was constantly trying to figure out like what can we learn more about what the hell is happening in North Korea. And one of the things I learned, Tommy, is like these DVDs would get smuggled into North Korea, of these South Korean soap operas. Again, not by us. I'm not saying like just you know, because like people want the content. And the thing that blew people's minds is like, what? look at these nice apartments that they're living in. Like Seoul yeah. looks like that. They just, they, it wasn't that they were that into soap operas, that they were like, they've been told about how much more impoverished the South Koreans were than them. And they just see these people in like nice apartments. You're seeing people like happy, like expressing themselves like freely in every way, shape or form. If it's a video, like you're seeing them like out in the club or something. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and yeah, like to, to me, this is like the longer term vulnerability to, to, to the North Koreans. Uh, um, now, the Chinese are trying to like perfect some capacity to have certain culture get in and to be so sophisticated they can block certain things. But um, given the proximity of South Korea to North Korea, and given the fact that K-pop is kind of the number one global music phenomenon, I think he's going to have a hard time uh, keeping that out. Yeah, good luck with that, pal. Uh, I don't think it's going to work. Uh, so two last stories. We, I promise to, uh, you know, we're going to spend a little time dunking on assholes. So we've talked about uh, Jair Bolsonaro before, the president of Brazil. He's an idiot. He's a right-wing authoritarian. So for some reason, he decided to board a plane to greet some of his supporters. Now, it turns out the people that liked him were sitting up front in first class in the more expensive area, but the folks in back and coach were not quite as happy to see President Bolsonaro. Here's what it sounded like. this guy like it's the, all these fucking guys like bolsonaro who put themselves out as like these populists the men man of the people like bullshit you know like you, you yeah. know you've got like yeah you're the man of some people who are assholes and then some rich people who like you know you take care of because you're corrupt but like most people feel like the people in coach did like get the fuck off the plane man one woman was literally flipping him the bird and yelling get out <laughs> bolsonaro genocidal <laughs> maniac like nobody's pulling punches anymore they're not no. scared of this guy brazilians like don't don't mess with brazilians i think pod save the world listeners know that mike pompeo uh was a terrible secretary of state but they may not know that he is also just embarrassingly bad on twitter so today he tweeted the following calling all unapologetic americans to join me and become a pipe hitter <laughs> p-i-p-e-h-i-t-t-e-r most of the worlds who responded to his tweet seemed to think that was a very surprising reference to was that a 420 was pipe. that a 420 tweet yeah. Or like, yeah, like, i don't know what he was talking about <laughs> mike pompeo seems to think it means proud to be an american I don't know, Ben. Maybe the solution is uh, Mike needs to log off and go away and just not be part of our political system ever again. I don't know. That's an idea. 
at some point, somebody somewhere is going to have to explain to me the appeal of this man to anybody. I mean, he, he's, he's clearly like he's, he's like nails on a chalkboard difficult to, to, to physically look at and listen to because he's so smug and arrogant in all of his presentation. This is a man who's so arrogant that like his is like formal slogan for the State Department was like swagger. You know, yes, it was like it's also not exactly like kind of the ethos of the foreign service. Right. Um, no, we've talked about this, but like what, where is the constituency? Who are the pipe hitters? Who are the, the Pompeo? <laughs> pi- who are the Pompeo pipe hitters? Like, who are they? Like, t- describe to me who is like standing Mike Pompeo. I mean, it, like maybe the staff at the at FDD, like the like the 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 foreign funded uh, yes. anti-Iran deal think tank crowd in D.C. Like, if that's your whole constituency for running for president of the United States, like, good luck taking that out for a swing. But apparently, uh, you know, uh, like, the pipe hitters, like, you know, will, will, will have their chance. I just would love to have just get my hands on the email chain of the approval process. It's like, yeah, yeah, Mike, uh, tweet out the, the pipe hitter thing. That's a, that's a real winner. Ben? You're in New York. You got big plans? You going to go to the museum and get something fun? Yeah, New York. I mean, I'm going to catch up with my parents, but like it just opened here today, just like it did in California. So like I'm thinking of going to a Mets game, like, nice. like I'll be hitting all the, the hot playground spots in Central Park with my kids, like definitely hit up like a couple of the museums. That's cool. Well, have fun there. Good to see you. And uh, we'll talk to you guys next week.